If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. Attendance increases and increases and increases, and you guys are doing it right. And as a political director from Massachusetts, I'm a little jealous. Uh, not just of the attendance, but also the talent you guys have in the room. Uh, so, uh, enough sucking up. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do was make sure that uh, you know, I was going to bring you guys uh, my entertaining talk, something that I talk about, Liberty. I've been on the road. I've been in the uh, 10th convention this year. Uh, and that being said, I brought a new talk. And I know I saw Justin cringe a little bit in the back as he's seen this... Uh, introductory screen for quite a while. Uh, this part talks about who I am, I'm a candidate for auditor, as uh, Chip mentioned, and political director for the uh, Libertarian Party of Massachusetts. I was the Northeast director for the Johnson Wells campaign. I have a radio show, Liberty on the Air. Uh, please listen to our uh, back catalog. We had Brandon on uh, last week. Uh, LibertyOnTheAir.com has uh, all the back episodes. Uh, I only cringed because I remember hanging the sign with you. <laughs> yes, Justin and I had to climb up on an 11-foot ladder to reach up to the 16-foot... Uh, yeah, it was, it was a little sketchy. And honestly, if you look at Justin and I, neither of us are shaped like we should be at the top of the ladder. <laughs> that being said, I, I put an asterisk on this one. Uh, I've had a really crummy week. Uh, those of you who know me, uh, follow me on Facebook know that uh, yesterday I went to my third funeral in seven days. Uh, yeah, I was just, just crummy. And the first one, uh, I did two of them, I think, uh, people in the room are familiar with. Uh, the first one was, uh, for those of you who know, uh, Chris Crawford, who's the chair of the Libertarian Party of Massachusetts, an active in the liberty movement for a long time. Uh, two weeks ago, her son died from an overdose, uh, 25 years old, uh, and really, Pretty tragic, uh, as you know, all deaths are, and in particular, it was an interesting thing because, you know, libertarians we have a uh, we have a very permissive idea in terms of what we think about people and drug use, uh, and you know, you stay true to those principles, uh, and you know, you, we believe that you know people can put whatever they want in, the bo in their bodies, but we recognize the uh, difficulty around that. Uh, the second funeral I went to. For those of you who were in New Orleans and came to the uh, Region 8 party, uh, you met my friend Chad, who was a delegate from Colorado, who was responsible for hosting the Region 8 party, which was pretty awesome. We had uh, great music and a video projector. Uh, and while we were there, uh, the next day after the party, Chad got a phone call that his longtime girlfriend had died. Uh, and so he flew out of there. Uh, she was 37 years old. And uh, it was, uh, it, that was certainly unexpected. And then yesterday I went to the funeral of a friend's mother, my co-host, uh, Liberty on the Air, Matt McLaughlin, his mother passed away. She was 75, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't unexpected, but it made me think a little bit about our time spent here and what we are doing and what we're doing with our time. And the fact that we are evangelizing. We go out and we talk about liberty. We're not doing it because, you know, that there's a profit margin at the end. We're not doing it like Republicans and Democrats, where we're seeking power. We're doing the opposite. We are seeking to set people free. And the liberty movement has a lot to do with that. And thinking of that sort of evangelicizing, I'm going to come out with a little bit of a talk. Have you heard the good news? <laughs> Liberty's back. Liberty is back, and it offers for you salvation. And I think this sort of thing comes better in a southern accent. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in liberty, I stand before you to give you my testimony and ask you to bear witness. I'm going to talk to you about salvation. I'm going to talk to you about redemption. And I'm going to talk to you about faith. I'm talking about forgiveness and being moved by the Spirit. What profits a man if he gains the world but loses his soul? That ends the southern accent. So salvation, that's the first thing we're talking about. We talk about saving, you know, in the church sometimes they talk about saving souls, but for us when we talk about salvation, we're talking about saving lives. I had the uh, occasion to go to the uh, Vietnam Memorial uh, two years ago, I actually was down in Washington, 
And I, actually, I walk all the memorials, and if you haven't done it recently, go do it again. Because we share a collective history. And the path has not been clear in terms of how we go from point A to point B in our history of seeking liberty and seeking to be the freest country in the world. And we know that we've misstepped along the way. We know that libertarians represent an idea of getting back on track. And when we talk to the younger generation who's never experienced a draft, the older people have an obligation, and when I say older, I mean me, of reminding people there was a point in time where the government went to kids and said, bad news, you're going to Vietnam. You're going to go over there and you're going to fight. You're going to kill people that you've never met. And really, for no reason other than the fact the government thinks that it's worthwhile. At the Vietnam Memorial, people tend to uh, leave things behind. You can see some of that in the pictures. And while I was there, there was a note that somebody had actually taped. Uh, and it was amazing. And uh, I actually took a picture of it, but uh, I don't feel comfortable sharing the picture because it was so personal. So I wrote out the text. And if you guys will allow you, me to read it to you. Hey, lover. It's been 50 years since I saw you. I'm an old lady now, older than your grandma when she drove us to the movies for our first date. When I saw her at your funeral, I wonder how, as frail as she was, she could stand there at the grave. And now I know because I'm old too. But not you. You're frozen in time. You're still the most beautiful boy I ever saw. And you made me promise when you left to remember that last look till you came back but you never fucking came back. But I'm not writing this to be mad. I'm writing because I still love you, and I'll see you soon, and I promised I'd write to you until we were back together. Not too long now. All my love, Sarah. So when we, libertarians, talk about being the anti-war party, we are talking about salvation. We are talking about saving these boys and sometimes it's easy for us to get down. It's easy for us to lose the spirit and to forget that this is what we're fighting for. We're not fighting for a casual thing. We're not fighting for power. We're not fighting for the ability to send troops overseas to fight for American oil interests. We're talking about saving these boys, saving these men and women, saving the people who shouldn't be sent to fight. And when we talk about that, when we talk about salvation, that's something that we should be proud to get out there and evangelize with. It should be something that we are proud to talk about marching hand in hand with. And what stopped the Vietnam War? It was activists like us. In many ways, we are the direct descendants of that movement. The first time that people got together and said government is really out of control. Well, maybe the first time since 1776 that the people got together and said government is out of control and we can change what is happening. We can stop this headlong path of a government that is no longer representative of we the people. We have to look back at our ancestors and say, they did it. They stopped a war. They stopped a war machine. They stopped a government war machine that's out of control. And it worked. So let us not forget that it has happened before, and we are the ones who will make it happen again. So, I want to briefly call out, you know, I did a little looking into this. 227 men from New Hampshire lost their lives in Vietnam. Uh, I want to call out one man named Stephen Philbrick, who's from Hampton. Is there anybody here from Hampton? No? All right, I figured I'd call it out. I, I confess, I, I don't know where Hampton is. I assume it's <coughs> over on the coast. Uh, but so Stephen J. Philbrook was born on October 4th, 1949. He served as a 0331, which I have learned it means he was a machine gunner uh, in the Marines. In one year of service, he ranked the, tank, the uh, rank of Private E1, and he began tour of duty on the 14th of 1969. June 6th, 1969, the age of 19, Stephen perished in the service of our country in South Vietnam at uh, Kang Tree. Uh, he's honored the Vietnam Memorial, uh, and in Hampton there's a park, uh, a nice little park they put together for him. <coughs> um, 
227 men lost in a day. We had, uh, I was talking with uh, my friend Chris, who lost her son, about how when she was growing up during the Vietnam War, every day they would publish in the paper the number of people who had died that day. Uh, and you know, you see these days that were somewhat intense. Uh, and then I thought about the 227 men that lost their lives in the entire Vietnam War, uh, just essentially 10 years of combat. And then I started thinking about overdose deaths. 437 overdose deaths in New Hampshire last year. So just in last year, more people died in New Hampshire from overdose deaths than died in the entire Vietnam War. And we started talk, looking at the daily statistics. So the daily statistics for opiate deaths dwarf the daily death significant death statistics from Vietnam. We are losing more people to this epidemic and we talk about delivering us from evil. We, libertarians, are the only ones who recognize the state's complicity in these opiate deaths that are happening. Okay, we know the simple truth that every state that has legalized medical marijuana sees at least a 25% drop in opiate deaths the next year. We also know that in places where marijuana becomes decriminalized, the options become even more significant that you start to see people who reduce their initial addiction numbers to opiates because they have somewhere else to go. One of the, people, one of the things that people don't realize is that 80% of the people who are addicted to opiates who uh, end up getting hospitalized for opiate addictions start on somebody else's pain prescription medicine. And a lot of people don't realize how the gig economy, to a certain extent, has had something to do with that. I'm sure it's the same in New Hampshire, but in Massachusetts, if you go to a Home Depot or a Lowe's, out front, there are a group of men who are looking out there for day labor. And in Massachusetts, it pays pretty well. You can get $100 a day pretty easily if you show up and you have a reputation for working. So there are a lot of people that that's how they support their family. $100 a day, you know, hardish physical labor, but that's good money. You can make a living doing that. And usually it's under the table. But the problem with that is you don't have health insurance. You don't have a vacation plan. You don't have sick days. And when you tweak your back or you tweak your knee, there's no time off. All that happens is that you're not working that day and your family is depending on you to bring home that $100 that day. They don't get that money. But somebody says, you know what? I got a bike in I can sell you for $25. And you're like, yeah. And if you take a Vicodin, for those of you who have ever had to do it and work, it's amazing. Your pain is gone, you are not impaired at all, and you can work the entire day. Hard labor. One day becomes two, two days become three, and the next thing you know, you're addicted. And suddenly that $25 for Vicodin, you start thinking, what are the other pain options for me? What do I need because this opiate fever that's raging in the back of my head needs to be fed. And then you turn to more dangerous drugs. And the problem is that you didn't have to turn to those main dangerous drugs if cannabis was available. Because cannabis fills that need for a lot of people. The government wants to respond to this by creating, uh, I saw de Blasio just created a four injection, a government sponsored injection safe spaces in New York City. Uh, they respond by saying, oh, well, you know, we're going to do other things to enable, when really, the simplest thing of all would be to legalize cannabis. And I know, New Hampshire, you guys are fighting for this right now. And I would argue that your fight is one for salvation. You're fighting to save lives. 437 opiate deaths last year. More than uh, the entire loss in Vietnam. And you can see the chart, right? Synthetic opiates through the roof right now. That number is going to get worse. So let's talk about redemption. Let's talk about the idea that we can and we must be the forces for redemption in our country. Does a country need redemption? What does redemption mean? <clears throat> the action or regaining of possession or something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. We have a debt to our founding fathers who spent a lot of time a lot of history lessons ingested to write out the best document they could. 
Okay, and so they gave us the Constitution. Caleb and I uh, briefly uh, tussled at the convention when we argued about which Constitution was older, the Massachusetts Constitution or the, uh, the brand spanking new New Hampshire Constitution, uh, because of course the Massachusetts Constitution is the oldest Constitution in continual use, written in uh, 1780, four years older than the uh, New Hampshire Constitution, but all of those actions came together and they came together specifically around this idea that as libertarians, we understand your rights are your rights. They're not granted to you by government. The language in the Constitution is so specific, right? Enumerated powers. The government has certain powers and your rights, the definition of your rights, it says, government shall make no laws that infringe upon your rights, not your rights are granted to you or allowed to you by government. We recognize that, that redemption, that idea that we ourselves are in control of our lives and we can redeem our lives, that is a powerful idea. And that's the idea that we spread, that we evangelize, that we are bringing to the people. When we say, we the people, we're not talking about just libertarians. We're not talking about just Americans. We're talking about everybody who identifies as a human. Because we recognize the fact that rights are human rights, not American rights, not New Hampshire rights. We recognize the fact that we are the ones who are still speaking about this. And we know that America has lost its way, right? We recognize the things that we did. We, we had the first peaceful transition of power in the history of the world from one political party to another. And yeah, we go back to the election when uh, Jefferson ends up beating Aaron Burr in the uh, 37th ballot in the House of Representatives. Okay, but John Adams had been the president beforehand. Uh, and you know, those of you who know the story, it's a, it's a pretty funny story that essentially uh, Alexander Hamilton, who you know, is obviously super popular right now, but goes 37 ballots, Alexander Hamilton is finally asked to weigh in for the, uh, for the Whigs. And he says, you know, I have argued with Thomas Jefferson about everything. We disagree on almost every matter of principle that there is. <coughs> However, Aaron Burr has no principles at all, so I would ask that you vote for Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and that's how Thomas Jefferson became our third president. And we did something that nobody else had ever done. A nonviolent transition from one political party to another. Now, we've done that a million times, well, not a million times, we've done that 20 times since. But that's a model. The model that the people are actually involved. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it doesn't feel like that to libertarians anymore. We don't feel like our voice is being heard. We feel like we have a government that tells us how things are supposed to go. We see the two major political parties, the old parties, and they're circling. 2013, the Democrats want to invade Syria and they want to make sure that the uh, filibuster is pushed aside so that they can get the people that they want into judges' offices and they can invade Syria and the Republicans push against it. 2017, the Republicans are the ones who push aside the filibuster so they can get the Supreme Court nominees in and they're the ones who want to invade Syria. So, four years, they have completely diametrically opposed positions. It's not about position. It's about the idea of position and opposition. Whatever position one party takes right now, the other party takes the position of opposition. Out of principle. Nothing else. In fact, the only thing that the Republicans and the Democrats have agreed upon in like the last 12 years are bills that restrict our rights. So, right? They want to spy on you, Republicans, and everybody, oh yeah, we're all in favor of spying. That's our unity. That's the purple that we have, right? The red and blue combined. We're going to agree on spying on the American people. Redemption comes from one other thing. Libertarians have always believed, and America was the promise that you can redeem yourself at any point in time. There's an argued, uh, there's a, uh, a theory called the frontier thesis which says that the reason why America is so different from every other country was that for a large part of our history, if you didn't like the way things were going, get a horse and go 50 miles west and you will now be in the frontier and you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. 
And that was American history for a long time. I would argue that maybe if you want to move to Alaska, you can do that. But if you think it's cold in New Hampshire. <laughs> so we've lost a little bit of that, but we have that in our spirit. That is the American spirit. The idea that at any point in time, you can put down what you had in your past and start again, start anew. And we recognize that in the gig economy, in the idea that we think anybody ought to be able to start a business, that we don't think government should tell people, should erect barriers to people starting, starting businesses. We are preaching redemption, that people can go out and do what they need to do to create new lives for themselves again. And we're the only people that's talking about that. Republicans and Democrats have lanes that they want to be in. We're the ones who say, screw the lanes, build a ladder, climb up. And we have to have faith. So Brandon and Caleb, I, I want to thank you guys, and I know that Chip did it as well. But for those of us who have been in a long time, we had faith that you guys would come. It was hard. I mean, for me, it was hard for a long time. But to see you guys, and now Laura, more people changing along the way, libertarians rising. You know, and, and there's going to be a point in time at which we're going to say, oh, you know, there's, there's 150. And, and so when you guys aren't as special, I hope that you still remember this moment. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I know. I know it's nice to be special. But, but we have to maintain that faith. And libertarianism also represents an idea of faith. Because you have to have faith in your fellow man to be a libertarian. Okay? You have to accept the fact that you are giving this guy, this woman, this person, that you are giving people freedom. Okay? And that they're not going to use that freedom to commit the most terrible atrocity possible. In our modern society, we live at the sufferance of each other. There could be no denying of that. If you think about the DC sniper, right? The Harvey Malvo, guy with a really high-powered rifle, uh, an incredible situation, and he just decided he wanted to shoot people. Okay? No reason, no rationale. We exist at the sufferance of each other. We exist at the idea that our only defense against something like that is individual liberty. And the idea that people have, within their personal lives, too much to lose. They have the opportunity to redeem themselves no matter how bad their lives have been. They have the opportunity to move on. And we have faith that people can do that. We advocate for the legalization of all drugs, okay? We do that because we have faith that as a community, there are always going to be people who are going to abuse drugs. That's always going to happen. That's not going to change from legalization. But we believe that we as a community can support ourselves, that we can support each other, that we can handle that liberty amongst ourselves, and that we don't need a government to intervene in that. We don't need laws that tell us uh, this is how you prevent a tragedy. We believe that we have faith in each other to say that tragedies are going to happen, but together, voluntarily, we can handle them all. And I have faith, of course, that you won't use aggression against me. I talk about this all the time. Okay, you know, we believe in the fundamental idea of the freedom of speech. That speech, that liberty of speech, only happens because of your tolerance. You guys could cut the mic right now. You could overpower me. You could stop me from speaking. But I have faith. Libertarianism requires faith. And especially faith in each other. And forgiveness. Libertarianism requires forgiveness. So, I stand before you a sinner, and I don't really believe in an idea of sin per se. But, if there is one, I have to tell you that in uh, 1982, I was a Republican. Uh -oh. And it's a good thing that they didn't have Twitter because you would have embarrassing <laughs> statements from me saying, no, it's, uh, I think the Reagan phrase was, it's morning in America. Uh, all sorts of things. But I was forgiven. I was forgiven by the libertarians who came before me and said, yeah, you know, everybody goes there. It takes a while to see to reach the conclusion that you can redeem yourself, that we have faith in humanity, and that fundamentally we forgive ourselves. And that's a critical component too. So I'm probably not the only person in the room 
who can be sitting at work or driving down the street and suddenly remember something that happened 25 years ago and say, oh my God, how did it, stupid, I'm so stupid, why did that happen? And then beat myself up about it for, five, for about five minutes. And a few years ago, I reached the conclusion that I can counter that with a little mantra where I just say to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. And so, I'm not a particularly religious person. I was raised Jewish, but I went to school in England and I learned uh, the Lord's Prayer. And there's a sentence in it that says, and I'm going to get it wrong now, but <laughs> forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. No, I'm not. People say I did it right. So <laughs> I think about that phrase and the idea that most of us are very gracious in forgiving people, but we won't forgive ourselves. A lot of libertarianism is recognizing the fact that by forgiving yourself, you are giving yourself the liberty to go out there and do more and more again, and to fail again, and to achieve those mistakes. Because if you're a person who berates yourself, Sometimes you can be held back by that idea, I don't want to do anything dumb again. You can be par paralyzed by analysis. But when you're in the process of forgiving yourself, you say, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to take that risk. I'm going to start a business. I'm going to build my own house. I'm going to do these things that promote my liberty because I'm not afraid and I'm willing to forgive myself and potentially extend that forgiveness to other people. And here's where I give you the hard ask. Okay, when I talk about extending that, first learning to forgive yourself and extending that level of forgiveness to other people. Think about what that means in the party. Okay, we deal with people in the old parties. We deal with people who propose statist ideas, even though we're not supposed to say statist anymore. We deal with people who have in the past represented the idea of, I am an elitist. I am super smart, and I know what's best for you, so please let me govern you. If those people are super smart, they do come to the conclusion eventually that liberty applies equally to everybody. You know, and one of the promises of America is that we don't have kings, we don't have philosopher princes, we don't have peasants. We are citizens united in this amazing idea, right? that all men are created equally and endowed by their creators with certain inalienable rights. <clears throat> and chief among those is the pursuit of happiness. So we redeem the earth through liberty and our idea that we represent a force for a world set free. And a world set free in our lifetimes. And for me, that's a lot shorter than for a lot of you in here. And that's something new for the Liberty Movement. We haven't had this many young people in a long time. So I'm glad that you guys are here. For George, it's even less time. But <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing. We talk about this idea that we are in it together. We are in it with a purpose that is larger than ourselves. And that makes us different from the old parties. Because the old parties and their political machinations, they're about achieving power. They're about ruling. They're about making a government that is designed to optimize the planet in their own vision. We don't want that. We don't believe that optimization works when you are one of the people whose lives becomes optimized and becomes marginalized and becomes controlled by a government. We evangelize because we have the spirit within us, the spirit that cannot be contained. I say this all the time to people who say, well, why can't you just put up with a little bit of taxation for a good cause? I'm like, it's not in me. You're going to have to punish me. You're going to have to break me. And then that's going to be on you. Okay? Now, if you ask me to put my shoulder to the wheel, to move a heavy load, I am happy to do that. But if you put a harness on me, I'm going to buck, I'm going to bite, and I will spit the bit eventually, because I don't want to be harnessed. And we all represent that. That's the spirit that's within us. And we live in a world where people's spirits have been broken collectively. And so I come before you today 
on the cusp of a week of just terrible things. And I'm asking you to recognize that spirit within yourself. I'm asking you to find that force for forgiveness within yourself and to find a way to bring that spirit and that forgiveness into your libertarianism and into your activities and find a way to tell people that you're not doing this for any other reason than the fact that you love your fellow man. Libertarianism is the political expression of loving, loving your neighbor. And it's taken me some time to realize that that's why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this because I want to be president. I'm not doing it because I want to be auditor of Massachusetts, as sexy as that position is. <laughs> but I'm doing it because I honestly and truly love my fellow man and the things that he and she create and the wonders of the world that exist because of our existence in it. And I want to set everybody free so the world becomes more wonderful. And I charge you all to do the same thing. Thank you very much for your time. You might say dad bod. That's the other phrase now. Hey, careful. Um, I got dad bod too. Man. <laughs> so, uh, in 2013, early 2013, a couple kids from Endicott College, which is in Beverly, uh, got really good fake IDs, went into town, bought booze, went back into uh, the campus and trashed the campus. And so, Endicott complained to Beverly, saying, how come you have these lax alcohol laws to allow these kids to buy booze? And so Beverly responded by banning the use of anything except for a U.S. passport and a Massachusetts state driver's license as a valid form of identification to buy alcohol, which is crazy. And of course, libertarians were not shocked that there were unintended consequences. And so a friend of mine came to me who owns a restaurant. He said, Dan, I had three weddings canceled last week after they passed that ruling. Because why would kids want to have a wedding in a town where their out-of-town friends are not going to be able to drink? And then I had another friend who came to me and said, so I had a problem in that in my store, okay, I had a uniformed soldier come in who presented his military ID that has his, and I wasn't allowed to serve him. It's like, that makes me feel like the biggest asshole on the planet. And maybe I did serve him anyway. But you certainly shouldn't be at risk of using your liquor license. And so several, after these people came to me, uh, they said, there's only 17 liquor licenses in the city of Beverly. They're all taken. None of us can afford to fight this. So we need somebody. I'm like, I'll do it. I'll do it. And so I ran on that one issue for city council, a race I was never going to win. But everywhere I went, I said, how is it possible in Beverly that you can't use a military ID, that a soldier in uniform can't get a drink? How is it possible that somebody from New Hampshire, who's 50 years old, can't buy a beer in a bar because he doesn't have a Massachusetts driver's license and he didn't bring his passport with him to travel to Massachusetts. So three months after I started running and talking about it, the city changed the law. We didn't even have to have the election. And as it turns out, it's a good thing because I got smoked in the city council election. Uh, you know, I didn't have kids who played soccer, all that other stuff. But sometimes libertarians win by running. And you guys made me so happy when you told me that you have 28 candidates running across the state. That's got to be the record per capita. And thank you. Because you're moving. You are moving the bar. And I mean, you know, New Hampshire, you've already put the bar over here. But you're going even further. And you're shocking all the big government states by not collapsing upon yourselves, by not degenerating. I mean, I, sorry, Donald Trump's comments about New Hampshire aside, New Hampshire's doing great, okay? You guys have more liberty than anybody else, okay? Businesses are starting up here. Uh, you know, I don't want to commend Governor Sununu, especially since he's about to be replaced by somebody in this room, <laughs> <laughs> who's not in this room right now. But the point being, uh, you know, he, he made this pitch for Amazon to move the Amazon headquarters to New Hampshire. And one of the things he talked about was how much better it is for everybody to work here for works at Amazon because they get a 6% raise over working in Massachusetts because there's no state income tax. And how much better it's going to be, you know, if they put it in Londonderry. And I believe Londonderry still is one of the last 22. No, Londonderry's out? All right, thank you. Uh, I know Boston's still in, but, you know, to put it in Londonderry, all these great things about it. 
And when the governor talks about the fact about how free the state is, and we're talking about a Republican governor, okay, that's a win. Okay, it, it doesn't just say it on your license plates, live free or die. It's something that happens here. And so what do I think the effect of my race is gonna be? Massachusetts, we have a little further to go towards convincing people <laughs> that they're allowed to be free. But we're doing everything we can. Uh, so my campaign has an event next week at Suffolk Downs uh, because gambling, right? That's one of the issues that libertarians are out in front on, right? We believe gambling should be legal everywhere. I mean, horse gambling, horse racing has been legal for since, I don't know, since forever. Uh, but we're going to have our convention in a casino because we think gambling should be legal. The government shouldn't be telling you what not to do. And so I really do think that there's a chance to win. Uh, and I'll tell you another thing about it. So I'm not just going to, so I've been hitting up Republican town committees. Uh, Governor Weld has been instrumental in helping me get into those. Uh, also, I've been hitting up, uh, you know, big business things to try to raise a lot of money. But I've also been going to the Art Revolution groups, which is the Bernie Sanders group. Okay, these guys, progressive Democrats, uh, we don't agree on a lot of things. But I give them a pitch and say, here's the thing. The one thing that we ought to agree upon, the one thing that we can say that will end tribalism, is that government shouldn't be wasting money. That ought to be universal. Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Greens like wasting money. But other than that, I'm just kidding, that's not what they like. Either. So maybe this is it. Because we are, as, as a country, are more divided now than we have been at any time since 1860. Okay? Republicans cannot believe any good about Democrats. You know, there's, a, there's an old political joke, and I'll tell it. The first person I had it told was Jesse Jackson uh, when he was running for president. He complained about how he used to get this terrible media coverage. And the story he told is, well, the Pope came to New York, and uh, we took him out on a boat on the Hudson, and a gust of wind came along, and it blew the Pope's hat off. It was floating there in the Hudson, and so the Pope reached out with his long stick, uh, and he couldn't reach it. And then the reporters reached out with their big boom microphones, and they couldn't get it. And so Jesse Jackson went out and walked on the water and brought back the Pope's hat. And the headline the next day said, Jesse can't swim. <laughs> so it feels like that sometimes. There is a feeling that, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of stuck in this morass where all the examples of liberty that we're giving to everybody aren't being covered, they aren't being noticed, but they are, okay? I'm sure you guys have been, uh, some of you have probably been in Ubers. Okay, you get a chance to talk to people and, you know, Uber, those guys are so close already because they see the gig economy. Okay? Converting Uber drivers, that's pretty easy. Converting people, conser converting people who are working for themselves, that's the next step. But we get these people to realize that getting rid of government makes them more free. That's what we're hoping to do. And so that's what I'm hoping my campaign does, makes people realize that everybody can be free. All right. So now, you guys have to go back to your convention. Thank you all very much. Thank you, George, for bringing this great party. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters. <laughs>